Hey guys, welcome back to How to Roll Dice. I'm Josh, and today I wanted to quickly tell you about some of these newer games that I've purchased lately, which I've already shown you, uh, but I've gotten to play a few of them now, and I've actually had a really good time with them. Uh, the only one I've tried to play that I actually haven't gotten to play is Cities of Splendor, and I'll go into that in a minute, but there's a little bit of a bummer there. Um, before I jump into the games, though, I do want to give you a little bit of an update on the shelving behind me, these two large shelves to my left and my right. They might look small to you because of this is a wide-angle lens, and so things that are very close behind me actually seem like they're far away and small, but these are two six foot tall, five foot wide shelves, uh, and they house about nine grand um, currently worth of board gaming, whatnot, um, and uh, quite a few titles, somewhere around 140 titles when combining main titles and expansions. Um, and uh, they are very full. <laughs> I said in my last video that there's no way I could fit any of my new titles onto those shelves, that I would have to find room for like two and a half feet of new boxes. I did somehow manage to do that. Um, I rearranged some of the boxes on the top shelf, which you guys can't see, it's, it's up here. Um, it's where I store the packaging for some of the tabletop war game uh, minis that I've bought in the past, just because I like the packaging, or actually I have a few that I've never unboxed because I stopped playing tabletop war games. And so, and I keep in mind, I am saying war games, not board games. When I say it fast, they do kind of sound the same in my head. So I wanna make sure that's not coming across to you guys. Um, anyways, that packaging was taking up some extra space because it has nice art on the front of it. And so I kind of wanted to show it off, but that's silly when the goal is the utilitarian feature of storage. And so I turned those boxes on their side and bought myself just enough space to fit all of my new games onto these shelves behind me. However, they are now 100% for certain full edge to edge on every shelf top to bottom on both sides. So I am going to need to add a third shelf, which will give me 15 feet wide, six feet tall, um, basically edge to edge in this room. You guys can't even see the walls um, of board games. And I will need to do that before I come back from Gen Con in August because I will likely be coming back with several new titles. Otherwise, I'm really not sure what I will have done at Gen Con if it's not buy games. Um, so anyways, um, these are some of the new games that I've purchased that I've now gotten to play. So on uh, sort of the first night this past Friday, I went over to my good friend Bryant and Sawyer's house and we played two rounds of Furnace. Now, this was a game that I picked up because I kept coming across it and I couldn't, when I say I couldn't get out of my head, I don't wanna say, I don't wanna sound like, you know, I was having dreams of it every night, like, you know, running through a wheat field, holding a box of Furnace, like that's not what I'm talking about. Um, I just mean every time I would see it on a shelf or see a review about it, I would take a quick look at it and I would go, I feel like I'd like that game. I don't know why. It just, it seems interesting. It seems fun. It seems simple. I like the theme. I like the look. Um, and so finally I picked up a copy and it's somehow exactly what I thought it would be. And I'm super happy about that. Um, it's a straightforward, easy to learn, easy to understand game that's hard to master, uh, that basically has you building an engine towards victory points during the uh, early years of the 19th, or I should say the 1900s, the 20th century, uh, the industrial revolution. And uh, like I said, it's it's very straightforward. It's a very nice looking game. It's got some wooden components. It's got some nice cardboard components. It's got some unique mechanisms to it as far as how those components work. For example, each player has to have a sort of player color marker so that once all of your uh, betting tokens or your auction tokens are out on the board on the cards, you can keep in mind who is what color player. Now, you could simply put a colored meeple in front of each player and that'd be perfectly fine, right? That's what most games would do. But instead, each player gets a unique sort of icon Con. One player gets a pair of silk gloves. That's the white player. The yellow player gets a pocket watch, which I, of course, immediately stuck so that it was sticking out of the pocket on my shirt while we were playing. The black player gets a little top hat and, you know, not like a little Monopoly top hat, but like a big cardboard sort of nice art piece top hat. Um, and then the red player or orange player, kind of, depending on how you want to read that color, uh, gets a wallet with a bunch of money sticking out of it. So that little extra mile that goes into the design of the game really sort of took it that extra step. Um, the artwork on the cards representing the different factories and mills and combines, that was all really nicely done. Not quite watercolor, not quite wingspan-esque, but really nice, high quality stuff, not just like lame clip art or sketches that you've seen on a million games before. The way the game flows is really smooth the way the auctioning is really cool. Um or the way the auctioning works is really cool. Uh, the way that you can quickly get the engine of cards that you have in front of you to start to crank out of control to the point where you're producing way more victory points and which are money, victory points are money in this game, uh, victory points and additional resources and upgrade tokens than you ever thought you would be able to do at the beginning of the game. It scales so quickly. The game is only four rounds long. And from the start of round one, where you're looking at the game and you're going, how am I ever gonna make anything? This is so slow and grindy 
to the end of round four where you're like, oh my God, so much is happening. There's uh, there's 15 cards in front of me. Okay, I can take the iron, I can turn it into oil, I can sell the oil, I can convert this into an upgrade token, which I can use to flip that, which pumps out more coal, and then I can sell the coal. And it's just, it turns into this crazy system in just four rounds. It's really, really good. Uh, the only component of the game that we haven't used yet are the capitalist cards. Capitalist cards are basically a slight asymmetrical feature that you deal one card out to each player, and that card has a small sort of passive ability on it, which that player can always take advantage of or can take advantage of in specific situations. Uh, and so each player will be playing the game under slightly different rules. The rule book says that you shouldn't use that or they recommend that you don't use that on your first couple of uh, games of Furnace because they want you to get a base understanding for how the game works. I feel like we absolutely have that now and I'm excited to try the capitalist cards on the next game. But right now I will say this is a very solid game. I really enjoyed playing this, super happy with this purchase. Uh, after that, we wanted to play, we played two games of that. We wanted to jump into a game of Splendor with the upgrades, the expansions from Cities of Splendor. However, when I opened that box up, sort of, I don't want to say my worst fear, but the thing that I was worried about happened to be true. And it's that out of the four expansions in that box, as far as I can tell, uh, you can only play with one at a time. There's a line at the bottom of the first page in that box that says these expansions can only be used sing singularly or, or singly or something like it's a weird word. Um, but it was, I didn't believe what it was trying to say is you can only use one of the time. If I'm misinterpreting that, and I hope I'm misinterpreting that, I'm going to look into it and find out. But because I didn't feel like reading the rules for four different expansions just to then choose which of the four we were going to play the game with, which would have added something like 30 minutes to the night, I was hoping it was just one base set of rules that covered all four expansions and you could just add them into the game. Um, we decided to hold off on that until I could better understand exactly what was going on here. Um, if you do actually have to choose one out of the four and you can only play one at a time, that's going to be kind of a bummer, uh, which is interesting because I went from thinking the box only held one expansion to, oh cool, it holds four expansions, to somehow, now that it's still only one expansion at a time, though still four options, that's worse. I don't know why I feel that way, but I feel like being given four options to make a game better, but then saying you can only do one at a time is somehow worse than if you just gave me one. Um, yeah, I don't know why, but that's how I currently feel about Cities of Splendor. A little bit of a letdown, but I'm hoping that I can sort of turn that frown upside down once I look into it a little bit more. Uh, then the next day, Saturday, we played these two games over here. Another uh, quick box game or small box game that I've purchased is uh, Side Effects, this game right here. This is a game that I bought, uh, again, at uh, Barnes & Nobles. I was kind of on a, in the mood to buy some stuff. And anytime I come across a game that says that you can learn it in three minutes, it plays two to eight people, and it takes under 30 minutes to play, is a game that I'm going to look into. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's good, so it's still a risk, but I like the idea of having games that I can whip out no matter how many people are in the room, no matter how good they are or experienced they are at gaming, uh, and we can fit it in you know, by the time the food that we ordered shows up. That's a really good game to have lying around. And you don't find good ones that often, and this one looked fun. Now, as I mentioned it, oddly enough, this is sort of the outcast side of the table. These two games over here both have themes that some people might find, I guess you could say, offensive or insulting. Um, I don't, I turn that switch in my head off when I'm playing games. I can be a very analytical, logical, political, you know, debatey type person. I love having high concept debates on really complex topics like philosophy and economics. That's one of my favorite pastimes. Um, I literally spend most of my time during the day watching podcasts or like listening to lectures on those topics because I think they're great. Um, I turn that off entirely when I'm playing a game. I can look at these and go, yeah, I could see how that might offend somebody. And then I immediately move on. Like that, that's, this is not the time for that. <laughs> this is the time to like get together and have fun and try to enjoy some strategy and some critical thinking with each other while playing a fun game. That's, that's the point. If you're coming into it to have like an activist debate, it's a weird place to do it at the gaming table. There are better venues for that type of thing. And I would ask you to leave. I'll have somebody else come and they'll actually play the game instead of just rail about what they don't like about its theme. Um, rant done. So uh, we played Side Effects. It was a lot of fun. There were only three of us. Now, a game that can play two to eight. Generally, I'd want to test that with like four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, all the way up the scale. And with some people who are less experienced with uh, gaming, because again, that's kind of the niche, the niche, the niche, the niche. I don't know, that I'm using this game to fill when I end up with a lot of people that don't really know how to game and I don't have a lot of time. 
boom, side effects. Um, and it was, it was, it was fun. It filled that slot well. I feel like if I added more people, even if they were inexperienced gamers, it would still be a fun game. Um, you get a group of disorders, like uh, maybe you have anorexia and maybe you have impotency, maybe you have suicidal thoughts. Um, and then you try to cure it with different, you know, therapy and uh, lithium and Valium and different pharmaceuticals. And while you're doing that, those pharmaceuticals can have side effects of other things like madness or um, anxiety. And so your opponents are taking madness and anxiety and throwing them at you. So now you have to deal with those disorders. So while you're solving some disorders, those cures are causing other disorders, which your opponents are inflicting on you, and you're doing the same to them. The first player to successfully simultaneously cure all of their disorders wins the game. And it's a cool system because players get to that teetering edge of victory almost instantly. Like your opening turn of the game, you might cure two of your four uh, disorders. And then your second turn of the game, you might cure a third and then put another disorder onto another player. And it's like, okay, I'm one away from winning. And immediately everybody, you know, their eyes just go, oh, stop them. And so all of a sudden you get, you know, three different disorders slammed on you. But the game has a, a pacing mechanism. You can't have more than one of the same disorder on you. So you can't have suicidal thoughts twice. Even if one of them is already cured, you can't have it twice. And so that stops you from getting hit with that again. So you kind of can't be completely annihilated because you can only have one of everything. You can't end up with this giant stack of disorders in front of you. The most you can have is like five or six. Um, and so it's it's a cool game. It's a, it's a fun, fast, simple to understand, easy to play game that doesn't get too cutthroaty. At least ours didn't. Um, and I'm excited to try it with more people to see how it goes. Uh, then moving on to um, possibly, you know, troublesome game number two, Puerto Rico the 2002 edition. This game, as I mentioned, has some very obvious themes of African slave trade in it. Um, like, when I say obvious, I mean like literal brown tokens called colonists coming over on ships called colonist ships that are then forced to, or not forced to, but you put them into plantations to grow your crops, to turn into products, to then sell. Like it's not, it's not hidden, uh, but also you could paint the chips purple and it like, if that makes it better for you, fine. And in fact, that's exactly what they did in the 2020 release of the game. They made the chips purple, and I think maybe they stopped referring to them as colonists, or maybe they still did. I don't know. It's obvious what it's about. It's not trying to be a historical, accurate, like, docu-series on the Caribbean African slave trade. It's trying to be a game about commerce and production and strategizing to make sure that you can actually spit out goods and sell them in a strategic way, because the number of goods that you can sell on a ship is limited, and the number of ships is limited, and the number of trade items that can be sold and the types of trade items that can be sold are limited. Um, it's it's much more about the way that you actually manage this type of an operation as to the mechanism by which the operation is run, which in this game is clearly represented by African slaves. Uh, so anyways, not a talking point that we were really getting into during the game. We were more trying to enjoy the game and enjoy it. We did. Uh, we had a lot of fun with it. I really liked the flow of the game because it's very quick for a game this crunchy. Not that it's super crunchy, but it's above average It's three, three and a quarter, something like that. Average being 2.5. Um, it moved really fast and it moved really fast because of a mechanism that Rising Sun also has. And I now know Rising Sun must have borrowed from this game, whether or not they realized it because 2002 versus like 2018, 2017 for Rising Sun. And that is each player gets to choose a role and that role is an action that every other player also gets to take, except the player who chose it gets to take a better version of it or the action plus a little bonus. And that means that each player's turn, every player gets a turn, essentially. When I choose to be the captain, and that means I get to place goods onto the sail ships, and those ships are then going to carry those goods away and I get victory points, I don't get to fill up all the ships on my own. I get to place one type of good, and then the next player gets to place as many of a type of good as they want. And then the next player gets to place as many of a type of good as they want. And if we then have room to continue placing goods of those certain types onto the ships, we keep going around until everybody either has placed all of their goods or there's no more room on the ships. And only then do we stop and go, okay, we've resolved the captain phase onto the next player's turn, which is they're going to pick a role. Maybe they pick mayor and that's when new colonists show up and colonists are going to get dispersed from the colonist ship that they arrive on onto all of the different players' boards, which will then get positioned either into San Juan or into different functional buildings or plantations. And so in doing that, that player choosing mayor 
every player gets new colonists and gets to rearrange the colonists on their board and gets to activate or deactivate plantations or buildings and adjust their whole sort of engine that they've got going. So every player gets that same turn that the active player chose. Now again, the active player is always going to get a slightly better version of the action. The active player who chose um, mayor is going to get an additional colonist from the supply. The player who chose captain is going to get to place um, uh, something like place additional goods or something. I can't remember. The idea is there's a bonus to the person who actually gets to choose the action. And so because of that mechanism where each player's turn is kind of every player's turn, every player is constantly taking a turn, which drives the whole game forward at three or four times the pace, depending on the number of players that you have compared to a regular Euro game where player one would take a turn and all they would do is their stuff and then player two would take a turn. And even if what they wanted to do is the same as what player one just did, they have to wait and do it on their turn. And then player three gets a turn. It's not like that. It's player one takes a turn and we all get player one's turn. Player two takes a turn and we all get player two's turn. So it's very simultaneous and fast and it gets things going very quickly. The game wraps up inside of two hours, even if you're playing, you know, a very strategic style of gameplay with it. At least that's what we were doing and that's how quickly it seemed to go. I will say we got some of the rules wrong during the first half of the game, but we hammered them all out. And by the end of the game, we had everything running like a, you know, smooth, well-oiled machine. And we had a ton of fun with it. We can't wait to play more of this. We can't wait to play more of this, especially with the capitalist cards. Uh, we really want to try side effects with a larger group. And I'm going to look into Cities of Splendor to make sure that I am, in fact, right, that you can only play one at a time. And even then, maybe I'll look through and pick which one I like and we'll give that a shot. Um, but anyways, I hope you guys are doing well. I wanted to let you know uh, sort of what I've been up to. Um, I am currently working on a very long video. It's like a 35 minute video on an intro to tabletop war games, what they are, how they're different from like a board game or a card game, what are some of the more popular ones out there, what do I do and do not like about them, and why I don't really play them anymore. It's, so it's a big video and there's a lot to put into it, but I'm like two thirds of the way done editing it. Um, so that'll be up soon. But anyways, I hope you guys are doing well. Uh, I hope you're uh, you know getting lots of games in, having a good time. Uh, and I will see you in the next one. Have a good day.